Let's pray. Father, we, we commit this time to you. We ask you to bless it. We uh, are very grateful for the opportunity to um, gather around this subject, and I pray you give us clear minds, clean, clean hearts as we address it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I was uh, given a great title for this uh, talk, Contextualized Presuppositionalism. I think that's 13 syllables, two words, 13 syllables. Um, and because this talk title is a mouthful, I'm going to begin with definitions. So, contextualism. Uh, contextualism has been a point of discussion and debate in missiology since the 1970s. And from the beginning, it's always been a high wire act. Now, uh, it's always been an issue since uh, there have been missions. So whenever you've had a missionary going into a for foreign culture, they've always had to address um, the issues that contextualization talks about. Um, but that phrase for it and the uh, particular um, modern framing of the debate has been going on since the 1970s, which is a uh, half good half century now. So on the one hand, you want to bring the gospel into an unbelieving culture in ways that are comprehensible to the people who live there. All right, that's the whole point. If you're preaching the good news, if you're bringing a message, you want the people on the receiving end to actually get the message. So you want to bring it to an unbelieving culture in ways that are comprehensible to the people who live there. And so you have to make it relevant. You have to contextualize it. Uh, but you have to contextualize it without dumbing it down or altering it completely. So that's the, that's the challenge. So on the other hand, you do not want to make it so comprehensible that both the message and the missionaries have gone native. Right? They, the people living there understand what they're already doing. And if you go, in, uh, you go into a, a tribe or a foreign culture and you blend, well then once you've blended, they understand you. Uh, they understand you because you're doing exactly what they've been doing all along. So that's comprehensible, but it's not distinctive. You can have it be so distinctive that it's not comprehensible and so comprehensible that it's not distinctive and, and hence the challenge. The gospel has to be authoritative over any indigenous customs or beliefs that are contrary to the word of God. So uh, Jesus says, uh, in the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So the Great Commission, the commission, our marching orders, the commission that we've been given to go present the gospel to the nations is a, a message that proceeds from a word of authority. So every, you cannot separate the gospel from the authoritative word. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. So it is. A, I would want to submit that it is a sin for Christians to go disciple the nations. We may not go disciple the nations. We must therefore go disciple the nations. Jesus says, I am in charge of everything. I own all. I now am Lord of heaven and earth, established in that, that office uh, by my resurrection from the dead. Romans 1, 4, uh, Jesus is declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. And then in Acts 17, uh, we're told that Jesus has the authority to judge all the nations, and that authority is given to him in the resurrection of the dead. So uh, on the basis of his resurrection authority, he sends, he commissions his church to go disciple the nations. So consequently, uh, when we go into a culture, we're going to find some things that are perfectly fine, perfectly innocent. They're eating certain foods that they may continue to eat. They are dressing in a certain way that they may continue to dress that way. Some things might have to go, but for the most part, there are lots of aspects of uh, a people's culture that will remain or be gradually morphed into a Christian form of the same thing. So the gospel has to be authoritative over any indigenous custom or belief that it encounters. And yet, the Christian faith has been translating, uh, the Christian faith has been a translating faith since the time of Pentecost. So it, with God's great kickoff rally uh, the, at, at Pentecost when the church is born, uh, the 
praises of God were being lifted up in all these different languages. There are 17 different nations mentioned in Acts uh, 2 there. So there are many different languages. So translating from uh, the gospel, Jesus died on the cross, he was buried in the grave, and he rose again from the dead. Translating that set of doctrines into another language is an exercise in contextualization. Right, you're, you're having to decide which word goes with which word, what's the best verb that would express uh, rising, and, and so on. So what is translation but linguistic contextualization? Here's a trivial, I'm gonna give you a trivial example, more serious examples. A trivial example, how to translate tree or bush. How to translate tree or bush when different languages have different dividing lines between a tree and a bush. Not all cultures define a tree and, uh, or the gray area between a tree and a bush the same way. Right? So how do, you, how do you translate from one language to another when the dividing line is in different places? Or in other cultures, the dividing line between the hand and the wrist happens at a different place. So in one culture, the hand includes more of the wrist. In another culture, a hand includes less of the wrist. So how do, how do you translate the sheep of his pasture into a language where sheep are as unknown as herds of yaks would be? You, they have no conception of what a sheep is or does or how it behaves. Do you just say, "Time, well, well, folks, it's time for you to learn about sheep? And then, and that solves a problem for you because you can just render it as sheep, right? Here's a new word for you. Non-trivial example, a non-trivial example, how to translate the word God into a language where the word for God is Allah. But the cultural definition of Allah is the one who by definition has no son, right? Allah has no son. And that's, a, that's part of the creed of the Muslims. Allah has no son, but the Coptic people, the Middle Eastern uh, people, were using the word Allah for God before the rise of Islam. So Allah is an ancient word for God that was then picked up by the Muslims, and they have defined it as he who has no son, but for the Copts and other um, uh, Middle Easterners who are, who are Christian, the word Allah might be perfectly fine. When the first missionaries got to Korea, uh, the Koreans were an animistic people. They had all kinds of spirits and demons and stuff that they trafficked with down here. Th those were the gods with whom they had to do. But they had a word for the most high god about whom they knew virtually nothing. Hananim was the most high god. So the most, most high god is Hananim, and that's all they knew. He's the, he's the creator god, but that's it. And then they had all the local deities. So the Christian missionaries in that situation preached Jesus, the son of Hananim. So Jesus is the son of Hananim. Well, that's an example, I think, of res responsible contextualization. Um, and depending on where you are in the Middle East, uh, you might have a, um, a difficult time or, or an impossible time trying to um, use the word Allah. This, this can be a thorny issue. Here's, here's another fun one. Um, when the Septuagint was translated, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew. So the Old Testament was given to God's people in Hebrew, and several centuries before Christ, um, a number of Hellenistic Jews translated the Old Testament into Hebrew, and they had to decide what, use, what, uh, what word to use for God, what what Greek word are we going to use for God? Well, the word they settled on was theos, theos, but they came within an ace of using Zeus. And you say, oh, that's not, that's not good. Well, that's because you're thinking of the Zeus of Homer, right? The Zeus of Homer is an overgrown celebrity uh, you know, chasing girls. And... <laughs> That's the Homeric Zeus, but then there was the Zeus of the philosophers, and and the Greek, the excuse me, the Latin word for God, Deus, uh, Deus, Zeus, Theos. The same. It's, they're very closely 
related. Jupiter is Zeus Pater, um, Zeus' father. So, but a lot of theology would be a lot different if the Jews had settled on Zeus as the translation of the God of the Old Testament, right? And you think, well, uh, well you're starting to pick up how words, that, words do not just have a denotation, they also have a connotation. And for us, the connotation of Zeus is all this other stuff. In a Muslim culture, the connotation of Allah is centuries of Islamic use. And, and that, so when you're, you can't just pick a word that you could defend from the dictionary, because I had no doubt you could defend it from the dictionary, but you have to defend it in the context in which you're going to employ it. And that context might be, uh, one word might be a total disaster, and the mission work fails because you chose the, chose the wrong one. So this can be a thorny issue. That's the issue of contextualization. Contextualization in any mission work, any cross-cultural mission work, is a necessary endeavor, but it is perilously easy to go astray. Uh, and you find yourself going native, you find yourself saying, well, I'm going to tech, I'm going to contextualize this by translating Aslan as Tash. Uh, and if you do that, you've, you've missed. So, contextualization. Presuppositionalism. Presuppositionalism is the school of thought in apologetics that insists that we must assume the truths of Scripture in order to arrive at the truths of Scripture. Let me say that again. We must assume the truths of Scripture in order to arrive at the truths of Scripture. We reason from the Bible, in other words. We don't try to reason our way to the Bible. We reason from the Bible. We do not assume the neutrality of history or of science or of reason or experts and then attempt to take the unbeliever by the hand and say, you and I both agree on the historical method, do we not? Or we both agree on si about science, or we both agree on the scholarly endeavor, and we take them by the hand and we try to reason from our shared premises, new supposedly neutral premises, we try to reason from those to the scriptures, to a faith in scripture. Presuppositionalists argue that the reasoning of finite creatures must of necessity be circular and axiomatic. All right. If you're a finite creature, you have to start somewhere. If you're a finite creature, you can't just know everything at once. You, you have to assume certain things or presuppose certain things. Uh, and once you presuppose that parallel lines never meet, then you can prove other things. You can assume certain axiomatic things and go on to prove other things. So the, presu the presuppositionalist says that I must assume the truth of Scripture in order to persuade someone of the truth of Scripture. Now, someone's going to say, uh, you're cheating, and, and they're going to say, isn't that begging the question? So um, to beg the question is a logical fallacy, and it's assuming what you need to prove. So when you, uh, it, the Latin name for it is petitio principii, begging the question. If someone says, uh, how do you know, uh, if you just said um, I, I, some cockamamie story that you reported to a coworker at work and they said, that's not true, that's not true, that's crazy. You, you wouldn't run down to the lobby to pick up a second copy of the same newspaper in order to show them an additional proof. It's the veracity of the newspaper story that they're questioning, and you can't prove the story by pointing to another variation of the same story. Another way of putting this is Honest Harry's used car dealership is not honest because Honest Harry says that it is. Right? So um, you can say, well, uh, yeah, it's a great, great used car dealership. See, look at the sign. And you say, well, look, I'm questioning Honest Harry's veracity, you can't point me to a sign that Honest Harry painted. So someone's going to say, aren't you presuppositionalists doing that with the Bible? When you're assuming the Bible, aren't you assuming what you need to prove? Um, the reason it's not a logical fallacy um, when it gets to this sort of issue is because for finite creatures, every ultimate question has to be addressed in a circular way. 
It's, it, it's inescapable. So when you're, if you're reasoning with an atheist and he says, well, you have the Bible, you're reasoning from the Bible, I have reason, okay? I use reason. And I can say, oh, what's your reason for that? Now, if he starts to give me a reason for that, what's he doing? He's appealing to his standard. It's like me opening and pointing to a Bible verse. Right? He's, he said, I said, give me a reason for reasoning. Well, if, he's give, if he gives me a reason for his reasoning, he's reasoning. He's assuming what he needs to prove. But I don't fault him for that because that's the position all finite beings are in. We have to start somewhere. Okay? Now, because we are presuppositional, we always ask the question, by what standard? When we're talking about whatever, whatever it is we're talking about, we're asking what standard we're using. Because we are contextualizing missionaries or contextualizing evangelists or contextualizing apologists, we are translating the question, by what standard, into a new and different context. But by what standard are we translating the phrase, by what standard? Still with me? Okay. You can run, but you can't hide. Now, here's the statement of the real problem. When you're doing evangelism, you're communicating or attempting to communicate. When you're doing evangelism, you're communicating. And that means you have two um, individuals. You have a speaker, communicator. You have a listener. And you have a message. So there's a medium between the two that transfers the message, and that medium might be the air, like I'm using right now. It might be a microphone wired to a recording device that then uh, uh, a year from now uh, takes these words and projects them into the air of somebody's room on the other side of the ro- other side of the world. But I've got a, a medium that is between one end of a communicator and a person who's communicated with. So this is the very nature of words, the very nature of communication. Words are never spoken into a void. Words are never spoken into a void. All communication presupposes at least a speaker, a message, and a recipient. A speaker, a message, and a recipient. If any one of these three are removed, then the communication is removed. If there is no speaker, everything falls apart. If there is no one to hear, everything falls apart. If there is no message or no medium to carry the message, everything falls apart. There is no communication. The recipient must also be equipped with certain things. Of course, he must have ears, a brain, etc. And he, he must also have a hermeneutic. A hermeneutic is his uh, system of interpreting, a system of interpretation. Without a hermeneutic, he's as deaf as a post. And a native of an unbelieving culture has a set of cultural ears, a cultural brain, a cultural hermeneutic, and so on. And this uh, denizen of this unbelieving culture, this native of this unbelieving culture, is... Two things. There are two things going on with him. In the first place, he's created in the image of God. And because he's created in the image of God, there are certain creational realities that are true of him. He is also individually a sinner, and he is also a member of a sinful, unbelieving culture. So, because he is created in the image of God, there will be certain things that you're saying that resonate with him. Because he's in rebellion against those things, he is going to want to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. He's going to, you're, you're saying certain things that he's hearing, despite his best efforts not to hear, and he is not hearing certain things because he has got his fingers in his ears and humming the Star Spangled Banner. So, revelation is communication. Revelation is communication, so that we have to apply these truths, speaker, message, recipient, to our understanding of revelation. The word of God is not spoken into a void. 
So we presuppose that the Bible is the word of the self-revealing triune God. God is the speaker. In fact, I think we could even speak this way. Um, we believe in God the speaker, God the spoken, and God the interpretation. So God the speaker is the Father, God the spoken is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Holy Spirit, we're taught in Corinthians, searches out the deep things of God. So the Holy Spirit is the one who searches out these things, and he is the interpretation. So we presuppose that the Bible is God's Word spoken to us. Now, the Bible is the word of the self-revealing triune God, who thereby reveals himself to man. The Bible is not the word of God suspended in the sky. It is the word of God to man. So uh, when, I, when I look at a Bible, I'm not, talk, I'm not looking at an artifact that sort of existed before the worlds were created. It, it didn't. The Bible is for this world. The Bible is for here. The, the Bible is God's word to us in this situation. It's God's word to man. The Muslims, incidentally, believe that, um, that I said earlier that we are a translating faith. The Muslims, uh, if you get a copy of the uh, Quran translated, it won't, it'll say something like the glorious meaning of the Quran. It's not, it doesn't translate. For Christians, the Word of God translates. The Word of God, like our Lord Jesus Christ, is, has incarnational capabilities. The Word can incarnate in different places, in different shapes. For the, for the Muslims, if you want to, if you want to um, deal with the Quran, you have to learn Arabic, and you or, or maybe not learn Arabic, maybe memorize it in Arabic, because that's the only way that's the only Quran you're ever going to get, which is the, the way the Quran is in heaven. But for Christians, the word of God is incarnational. The Lord Jesus was the incarnate second person of the Trinity, and God speaks his words to us into the rough and tumble of our existence. So it's the word of God to man. So thus we have the three elements necessary to communication. The speaker is God, the message is the word, the recipient is man. Speaker is God, the message is the word, and the recipient is man. And man, in order to hear, must have a hermeneutic. As Jesus put it, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So I can't, I can't hear the word without ears. I can't, hear, I can't read the word without eyes. I can't understand the word without a mind. Right? I've, in, in, in order for God to talk to me, if I'm, I'll put it another way. If I'm presupposing revelation, I'm presupposing that God speaks, I'm presupposing that there is a spoken word or a written word, and I'm presupposing that I'm here to hear it. I have to presuppose the entire package in order to say the word of God to man, All right? So he who has ears to hear, let him hear, Matthew eleven fifteen. Now God bestows the necessary hermeneutic to understand his revelation. This is a gift of God. It comes, um, the software is loaded. Okay, we have, uh, we're created in a certain way. The hardware, some, a medical doctor could tell you how the ear works and how the ear canal works and how this bone uh, picks up the vibration. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can explain all that, but that's just the contraption. Uh, there's something spiritual going on when you are, coming into an understanding of words. And if, you've ever, if you ever want to uh, trip yourself out, just, just spend, a, spend an hour or so watching a toddler go around understanding things. And, and you'll see, uh, he, he will, generally speaking, they understand far, far more than they can express. And, you know, they've said two words in their entire life, and you say, uh, here, could you put this? Could you take this and put it back to your next to your mother's sewing machine? And off, off he goes, and you say, "Oh, well, more good." And you find it there, right where you've told him to put it. Um, so, what's happening there is that the human mind has a deep linguistic structure embedded in it, right? a deep linguistic structure um, embedded, just built in. 
and we are language learning beings. And you might say, what, uh, what language do you think would be hardest to learn besides English? <laughs> English doesn't count. I, I, let's say I pick something like man, uh, Chinese, right? So Chinese would be a very, very difficult language to learn. And it was done by millions of Chinese two-year-olds, <laughs> right? It's just, and they just do it naturally. They just sop up the language, and they all of a sudden, and it's the same thing for them coming here, where English is, I mean, we've got our quirks, mostly many of them having to do with William the Con Conqueror and, and uh, obscure battles that one tribe lost, and you know, O-N-E, like look at O-N-E. How do you get a wuss sound out of that? One, one, <laughs> where's the waka? So, excuse me. So, God bestows the necessary hermeneutic to understand his revelation. Everybody gets, the, everybody gets this. Everybody receives this gift. This is because all of us are descended from Adam. But all of us want to suppress what we're getting as it relates to God because all of us are descended from Adam, same, the fallen Adam. For example, God reveals himself in the created order, and that revelation is made possible by the hermeneutic that man has within himself in spite of his best rebellious effort. So consider this from Romans 1, 20 and 21. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, I'm going to italicize certain words with my voice, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Three key words are found in this passage. Katharao, distinctly apprehend, noeo, to comprehend, and gnosko, to know. What Paul is telling us here is that everyone knows. Everyone already knows. Since the, and when, when have we known? Well, since the creation of the world. Is this knowledge enough to save? No, but it is enough to condemn. So everyone knows enough to know that they are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Just a, a side comment about evangelism or apologetics, or if you're at that part of the, uh, let's say you've translated uh, the gospel into the native language of the people you're dealing with. Um, Paul says that this knowledge that everyone has, they are suppressing in unrighteousness. They are suppressing in unrighteousness. They don't want to honor God as God, and they don't want to give him thanks. Those are the two things that the unregenerate heart does not want to do. They don't want to honor God as God, and they don't want to give him thanks. So they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So picture the truth as an overinflated beach ball. And this overinflated beach ball is something that everybody, everybody's standing in the swimming pool up to their waist, and everybody's got this overinflated beach ball pushed down under the water. And they're holding it there because they don't want to acknowledge the beach, the beach ball. And your job as an apologist is to come up and poke arms. <laughs> get you, get you. <laughs> because the, and they're going to start quivering, and people who are not far from the kingdom are, have the shakes all over because they're trying to keep this knowledge uh, away from them. But they all have it. Right? They're all, at, everybody at some level is responsible for the knowledge that they have and which they are suppressing. The way this knowledge is described, it appears, this, when Paul says, clearly seen, understood, knew God, it appears to be the result of an innate hermeneutic and not the end result of years of study in some graduate school. There's a deep linguistic structure to the human mind which we presuppose. We have to presuppose it. 
That's part of our presupposition. We presuppose that God speaks. We presuppose that he has created a world in which his message crosses the divide between God and man. And we presuppose that man, and please note what I'm saying here, that man at some level always hears. God speaks. There's a medium that communicates what he is saying. And every man at some level understands and, then, and doesn't like what he is hearing. I need to say something else. Um, and this is important because some people um, have, some Christians struggle with what Paul teaches here in Romans 1 because they know that, that they have non Christian neighbors and people they're talking to who appear to them to be as sincere as all get out. You know, they're kind and thoughtful and they ask questions and they appear to want to know. And, and then, how do I reconcile that image with what Paul is saying here? You have to realize that the human soul, the human mind, the human heart has all sorts of twists and tangles. The Bible says very clearly that man, uh, no one seeks after God. No one wants to know God. Uh, they've all turned aside. They've together become worthless. And at the same time, the Bible does not encourage us to think that non-Christians are like orcs in Middle Earth. We're, we're not like orcs in Middle Earth. We're not... We're, um, Sometimes Calvinists have uh, muddied the waters by using the phrase total depravity. Um, now I, I affirm the doctrine of total depravity, but total depravity sounds like absolute depravity. Right? It sounds like an orc. Um, the, here, there's a totally depraved one. Well, total depravity simply means that every aspect of man's being is corrupted by sin, and as such that he cannot save himself or prepare himself to be saved. It's not like total, total depravity of the, of the non-Christian is not like a glass of ink. It's not like a glass of ink. It's more like a glass of water that you dumped a thimble full of ink into, and the ink gets into everything. The, the ink pervades the glass of water, but it's still a glass of water, right? So the person you're talking to is still a human being, created in the image of God, uh, they still bear the image of God, and the ink has gotten into everything, and they don't like the fact that they're created in the image of God. They're at war with the fact that they're created in the image of God. They, that's, their, that's their difficulty. So we presuppose that the human mind is already in possession of the, of the facts that I'm trying to communicate to them, that there's a majestic God in heaven. I owe my existence to him, I am responsible to him for my behavior. Now, this knowledge that Paul tells us in Romans 1 does not include the knowledge of a savior. It does not include the knowledge of a savior. It does include the knowledge that we are in need of a savior if we are to be saved. So, we presuppose this structure, this deep linguistic structure, is common to man. And so, while it may have a few variations from one culture to the next, the essential elements are always there. God has seen to it, God has seen to it that he is always saying the same thing in the sun, moon, and stars. God says this, what God says in the sun, moon, and stars to the Hindu is the same thing he says to the Muslim. Is the same thing that he says to the atheist. It's the same thing he says to every man. Sun, in the sun, moon, and stars, God's message is um, clear, straightforward. In addition, provided that it is a good faith translation and not the work of heretics, say, who are up to some funny business, God has seen to it that he speaks through his word. So when the Bible is translated into this uh, person's native tongue, God is speaking to that person through his word. When we are witnessing to others in the power of the Spirit, we are not speaking to the people about God. Right? That, that would be um, uh, a failure in evangelism. When you go, 
uh, if you went sightseeing somewhere and you saw, saw the sights and then you go and tell a friend about that thing, uh, they're living vicariously through your experience. You're telling them about something. When you were witnessing in the power of the Spirit, in that moment, God is revealing himself, just like he reveals himself in the sun, moon, and stars. God is revealing himself. He's speaking through you. If you're using words that are scriptural and true, that are grounded in the, uh, grounded in the word of God, when you say that Christ died on the cross and he invites all men to believe it, look to him and, and be saved, when you say that in the power of the Spirit, God is saying that to that person through your words, through the instrumentality of your words. God reveals himself. God reveals himself through what is happening there. And, the, and here's the cash quote. Here's the takeaway item. God is a participant in all of this, and he is far better at contextualization than we are. He's far better at contextualization than we are. And you know why? Because he's the God of all the contexts. He, he's Lord of all the contexts. He knows all the variables. He knows, the, he knows the hairs on this guy's head that you're talking to. He knows how many molecules make up his right arm. He knows everything about this person. And so consequently, when God reveals himself to this person, he is able to adjust the wrinkles. If you, this is one of the, one of the uh, wonderful things about coming to a reformed understanding of the sovereignty of God. Maybe you remember, I, I think many of you do remember, when you were, um, before you knew uh, the glorious truth of God's sovereignty and you witnessed to somebody and you shared the gospel with them, have you ever had the experience of you going home afterwards, kicking yourself the whole way because you screwed that up? And not only did you screw that up, but he is going to go to hell for eternity because you're a screw up. <laughs> right? He is lost he is lost forever. Why is he lost forever? Because I forgot to use that illustration. That I, I, or I used a bad illustration. Or I, I used the wrong word, and then he laughed that I was ignorant. And I, I, I'm just... Uh, 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 uh. How, many, how many people have had a really hard time thinking that the evangelistic moment is something that we are the Lord of? We are not the Lord of it. Christ is Lord. And if Christ is Lord, then what, of course, the, you don't say, well, okay, let's sin that grace may abound. You don't say that. You, you want to do the best job you can. You want to give uh, the Lord good material to work with. But you do it knowing that whether or not you succeed in giving him good material to work with, he is the Lord of the moment. Right? He can reveal himself. And if you are sharing the gospel in good faith and you're doing your level best, best to stay close to Scripture, God can contextualize it for you. Now, what's out of court? The relativist wants to affirm and twist the idea that everybody has his own innate and individual hermeneutic. But the fact that it is innate within me this hermeneutic, my, my ability to process information, the fact that it's innate within me does not mean that I'm in charge of it. My kidneys are innate, but I do not give them instructions. I have no idea what they're doing, right? I don't tell them what to do. I don't tell them how to do it. I don't tell them when to do it. And I'm not even sure sometimes whether it's the liver or the kidneys that are doing which or whatever. It's not up to me. But... That's, an, that's innate part of me. I don't understand how I can understand. I don't understand how I can understand. How can Augustine think a certain thought in the, in the fourth century, have a certain thought, write it down on, on papyrus and in Latin, and then have that recorded, preserved over the course of centuries, have someone else translate it from Latin into English, have it printed in a book, have it sit on my shelf for years, have me pull that book down, open it up, and have me think the same thought that Augustine had. How's that possible? That's magic, right? It really is. Information, I'll put it another way, information is spiritual. 
Information is spiritual. The word is spiritual. Um, there's a fallacy that the naturalistic materialists um, readily fall into a fallacy that can be called nothing buttery. They can say the human being is nothing but these chemicals or nothing but meat and bones and protoplasm and neurons firing and stuff. You're nothing but the chemicals that make you up. Well, information, that sign that says exit right there. If I said, oh, you know, let's say that there was an emergency somewhere and I said, okay, everybody, there's the exit. And one of you were a materialist and you said, that's, that's simply plastic. Uh, there's a light behind some plastic. And no, there's information there. And the information is not material. The information is not material. The information is spiritual, right? So we are spiritual beings, and that means we understand. That means, and we don't know how it is we understand, but we do. So the relativist who says truth is in the reader's eye cannot make his case relatively. He must make an absolute case for relativism. This is a commonplace of presuppositional apologetics. If he does make an absolute case for relativism, he is contradicting himself and we don't need to listen. If he does not make a case, then we have no reason to listen to him either. There are no absolutes, he said absolutely. He can't say there are no absolutes except for this one. Because then we say, where'd you get that one? Where'd you get that one? For, uh, Sunday school? Where'd you get that one? If he says there are no absolutes, then we have to say that includes your whole framework, right? Everything you're saying. But as he struggles to make his case, we should watch him closely. He's not just arguing his case. He's expecting a certain hermeneutical courtesy from us, his listeners. And that brings us to the next point, which is the central point. That is the inescapable hermeneutic. Once the nature of communication, which includes revelation, is established, we notice something curious about this problem. It will not go away. The difficulty is not limited to Christians and their Bibles. Everyone who speaks or writes presupposes a hermeneutic. Of course, we see a presupposed hermeneutic in ordinary discourse. If someone says, please pass the mashed potatoes, you don't reply, and ice cream has no bones, and the higher they fly, the much. <laughs> Uh, they, they would say, you're just messing with me, which would be true, you are. Of course, we see a presupposed hermeneutic in ordinary discourse. We all behave by the same rules. We're talking with one another, and all of us drive on the right side of the road. We have certain ways of getting along. But our concern is the presupposed hermeneutics in discourse about ultimate issues. Common sense, common courtesy, natural discourse is inescapable. God, in giving us language, has seen to it. God has given us this spiritual gift, and everyone has this spiritual gift of being able to talk and being able to hear and know that this person at the other end of the table would like the mashed potatoes. Have you ever heard of a grander mystery than that? <laughs> what am I going to do? I'm going to inflate my, the, I've got these bags inside my chest, and I'm going to inflate them, and I'm going to push some air past my teeth and I'm going to constrict muscles in my throat in a certain pattern that make certain sounds come out. Mashed potatoes. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to create sound waves down the dinner table, and another person is going to hear those sound waves, they're going to go into his ears, and he's going to have a brain that translates that, and he's going to reach for the mashed potatoes. And you don't believe in miracles. <laughs> so... The words of God or of, a substitute, uh, uh, or of a substituted idol are always received according to a straightforward understanding. But it's straightforward understanding of an enormous mystery that's underneath it. In ultimate issues, a man's final authority is never understood in any other way. This is a handy way of identifying the God of the system. The God of the system always insists on being treated with this kind of respect. Right, you see what I'm, the, uh, we, we conservatives oftentimes object to how the Supreme Court um, treats the Constitution because it's a living document and it stretches and only stretches to the left, but it's stretchy. And 
it's, it's stretchy, and they, they, they do all kinds of things to the Constitution. And we say, oh, we don't like that. But they're, they're really with us. In what way? Well, they do share our hermeneutic. They do share our hermeneutic. They don't share our God. But this is how you identify the God of the system. Do they allow us to apply to their decisions the same hermeneutic that they're applying to the Constitution? When they say, they say the right to keep and bear arms means that exactly you don't have the right to keep and bear arms. Do we get to read that decision and say, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for affirming that I have the right to keep and bear arms. No, I said you don't have the right to keep and bear arms. Thank you for, we can't stretch their words the way they're stretching other words, right? Why, can't, why won't they let us stretch their words? Because they're the God of the system. The God of the system always insists that his words or their words be taken in a responsible, what, what one might be called a historical grammatical way. So what do we need to presuppose? This is going to require more development, but what needs to be, what needs to be presupposed by us in evangelism, in cross-cultural evangelism, that is what mission work is, what needs to be presupposed what needs to be presupposed is the way things actually are. That's what we need to presuppose. There is a real world out there that is a certain way. God made it that way, and he told it to stay put. You don't need to know all the precise details of how things actually are. You don't begin at the end, but you do have to be committed to the truth a priori knowing that such objective, unmovable truth, which is so necessary as the foundation of every form of knowing, is not possible apart from the bedrock of a true and living God. In other words, if there is a true and living God who spoke the world into existence, then the world can be, be steady when we try to stand on it. If God spoke the world into existence, then I can have certainty with my creaturely endeavors at knowing. If there is no God, then you're trying to stand on a waterbed. Right? Everything is, everything is topsy-turvy. There's no, there's no knowledge of anything. So I must presuppose that God spoke the world into existence, and he spoke the world into an existence in a certain way, in a certain configuration, and he put people like me into the world expecting us to know what was going on. He wanted us to have the five senses we do, and he wanted us to speak to one another about what we discovered. He wanted to speak to us. Uh, Adam was created speaking. God would come down and commune with him. Adam was created as a speaking, thinking being. The first recorded words in Scripture are not only uh, beautiful, they're, they're poetry. When God brings uh, Eve to Adam, the first spoken recorded words are poet, poetry. Adam speaks, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But beginning with the fear of the Lord does not mean beginning with the Lord alone, the Lord solitary, the Lord isolated. No one can know the Lord that way. That's incoherent. It's oxymoronic. God cannot be known by us raw. Right? We, God cannot be known by us from outside. God cannot be known from outside God unless there's a creation in which the knower lives. And if he lives in a created order larger than himself, then he also knows things other than God simultaneously with his self-knowledge. And these other things also testify to the majesty of the God who created them all. And this is, I'm presupposing the whole shebang. I'm presupposing all of this. So prior to the creation, prior to the creation, there was no fear of God. In order to have the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge, it is necessary to have a knowing subject who does the fearing and who knows himself to exist as a fearing creature. Moreover, he lives and moves and has his being in a world within which that fear makes sense. That fear makes sense to the creature because he presupposes the whole operation. He presupposes who the God, the God who is, the world, the world that this God spoke into being by the word of his power, the holy law that our first parents first disregarded. 
and the scriptures which declare to us his spelled out explanations of all that has come to pass. So then, <coughs> if I presuppose a creator, then heaven and earth, heaven and earth must be contained within that presupposition. If I presuppose a savior, then a word containing gospel is contained within that presupposition. If we say that God wrote two books, his word and the world, then it makes no sense to pit those books against each other. God is perfect, and the books he wrote need to be perfectly harmonious. The world has to harmonize with the word and vice versa. Not only can I not consider God independently of the created order, I cannot successfully isolate his word to us from that created order. In order to read a Bible, I have to reckon with a cascading series of things like who taught me how to read, a cow that contributes leather for the cover, paper ink, the light that strikes the page, the physical eyes that receive that light, the brain cells that remember what I read yesterday, and so on. How shall they distribute tracks without a typesetter? It is not the case that the world that the world comes to me through this portal and the word through that portal. God is the living constant, and he is speaking at all times and through all things. That's the context. So basically we, what we want is a God-soaked contextualization. God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We want a God-soaked contextualization. This is something precious that I learned from Van Til. He said, he said that if there were in the, in the radio in, on your car dash, if there were one station, if there were one station where you could turn the dial and not be hearing God, everybody in the world would have their, state, have their radio tuned to that one place so that they wouldn't hear him. But there is no such place. We are hearing God all the time. God is speaking all the time. God is shouting at us all the time. He shouts at us in the blades of grass, in the leaves on the tree, in the sunrise, in the funny, looking, uh, the funny look that many animals have, the elegant look that other animals have. He, God is speaking to us. He says, look, I have a sense of humor. Look, I have a sense of majesty and beauty. And look at this. And look at that. He, he's co constantly talking. So what I want to do is embrace everything, God's revelation of himself in his word and his revelation of himself in the created order. So like all presuppositionalists, to conclude, like all presuppositionalists, <coughs> I try to reason from the scriptures instead of reasoning my way to the scriptures. I don't want to presuppose a neutral space from which I try to get others to become Christians. You don't become Christian from neutral places. You lay down your arms. You're a rebel. You're in rebel-controlled territory, and you must be persuaded to lay down your arms and surrender, and it's an unconditional surrender. But when I presuppose Scripture, there's yet another foundational layer underneath all of that. I must presuppose a God who is absolute. I must presuppose a God who is absolute and who has revealed himself in absolutely everything. In the words of Schaefer's great title, he is there and he's not silent. He is there and he's not silent. We don't serve a pie dough God. God's omnipresence is not, God's not like pie dough where the farther he spreads, the thinner it gets. The, the doctrine of God's omnipresence is that Everywhere God is, he is entirely there. Everywhere God is, he's entirely there. God is not partially distracted. He's the one in whom we live and move and have our being, but we are not living and moving and have our being through a fraction of God. We're, we're not, we don't deal with parts of God. We don't deal with portions of God. God is above all, under all, before all, behind all, and through all. And that's, and that's the context that we can function in as we, as we presuppose that and as we trust him for our endeavors at translation, our endeavors at contextualization, knowing that if he blesses it, it's blessed. If he doesn't bless it, it's not, it's not going to do any good. We, we rely and trust on him. All of this, all of it, everything I've been saying tonight, all of it is above our pay grade.
all of it. That's why we have to trust God. That's why we have to um, submit the whole thing to him. We, have to, we can study it to realize and learn how much we don't understand it. But once we've gotten that, we, can, we have enough information to adore. We have, we have enough information to bow down. And we have enough information to trust God to do with this wonderful message, this wonderful gospel, the things that we know that we can't do with it. God can use us to do things that we could not do, could not ever do in our own strength. Our Father in God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for this opportunity to consider all these things together. And we pray in the name of Jesus and amen.